Right. Getting started with the ESP8266. Seems right. What? What? What does that mean? When I wanted to write native code and upload my own firmware to the ESP01 and NodeMCU modules, I embarked upon a journey through a lot of different platforms and frameworks, out of date or incomplete documentation, and a learning curve that was at odds with my impatient need to write my own code and get it running on the device. In this video I will show you in very clear steps how I overcame this and went from zero to hero and got both of these modules running my own tiny ESP8266 firmware natively. This works on Windows and Mac OS the same way thanks to a tidy little Linux virtual machine which I show you in my previous video how to set up. If you're already running Linux this video should be a breeze and if not it should be easy for you to follow along and get up to speed and it'll be pretty clear about everything as we go. You can follow this guide and get your system ready even if you don't yet have any ESP8266 hardware, but the modules that I'll refer to are the ESP01, which you can get for as little as $2 on eBay, and a clone of the Node MCU, which you can get for as little as $6 on eBay, based on the ESP12e module. The Node MCU requires only a micro USB cord to plug into your PC, while the ESP01 needs a couple of other parts which I'll explain later in the video. I'll show you how to build and upload firmware to both the Node MCU and the ESP01 respectively, so let's start with an overview of those two parts. First, let's take a look at the tiny ESP01 module. This board's design is one of the earliest released, but due to its ubiquity and its low cost, it's still pretty popular. It features the ESP8266 microcontroller with integrated logic for handling Wi-Fi and TCP IP. Adjacent to the microcontroller you have the flash ROM for storing program code and data, which in the blue solder mask version of this board is usually half a megabyte, but there's also a one megabyte version identified by a black solder mask. You also see the integrated Wi-Fi antenna and other support circuitry at the top, and the board also features a power LED, a serial communications indicator LED which can alternatively be used for basic diagnostics, and eight header pins at the bottom for power, programming and some basic digital I.O. Like most ESP modules, this device can be run autonomously so long as you have a, a meaningful firmware loaded and a 3.3 volt power supply. And that voltage is important because the device is definitely not 5 volt tolerant. Now on its own, you can't plug this device directly into your PC, so you will need some sort of basic programming jig. And I've got a very simple example of one which I've made here. This just bridges the ESP01 module to a cheap USB to serial adapter and includes a couple of extra buttons on the back for putting the device into programming mode. I'll explain the design of this board as well as the correct programming procedure later in this video. Now compare the ESP01 with the Node MCU board, or in this case a cheap Chinese clone, and you'll notice that the ESP01 has a counterpart on this board known as the ESP12e. It's effectively the same hardware, but the notable difference is that it has this RF shielding can which conceals usually a larger flash ROM, as well as extra pins around the edge which are broken out to header pins by the Node MCU as GPIO pins. Um, the Node MCU also includes um, an integrated USB to serial adapter, which is usually based on the CH340G chip or the CP2102. And there's also a voltage regulator which supplies 3.3 volts from USB to the rest of the board. You'll notice that the board also has a couple of push buttons, one for manually resetting the device and another for manually putting it into programming mode. But if you're using the correct software in conjunction with the USB to serial adapter on the board, you'll find that this is handled for you automatically. The Node MCU is intended to be used with a breadboard, but depending on the revision of the board you've got, you may find that it doesn't fit into a single breadboard. And so I usually straddle it across two to get the maximum number of columns available for wiring. Now that we've got an overview of a couple of different types of modules, and there are many more, We'll go through the procedure of setting up a development environment so that we can build firmware and upload it to the device. At this point I should reiterate that it doesn't matter if you're running Windows or in this case MacOS because I'm going to be using a virtual machine running Ubuntu Linux. My previous video shows you how to set this up so if you haven't seen it already I suggest you go and check it out now so you can follow along more easily. Otherwise, let's get on with it! Launch VirtualBox and do a detachable start of your VM. The Virtual Console comes up and Linux goes through its boot process landing at the login screen. Now login is your user, for me this is literally just user, and then run LSUSB. This lists USB devices that Linux has attached. 
We'll now monitor the kernel log to see how the system will react as a new device gets added. So to do that, run tail dash f slash var slash log slash kern dot log. Dash f means that we want to follow the tail of the log file as new messages get added. And we can see some messages left here from the boot process, so hit enter a couple of times for visual separation. Click the USB button in the status bar and you'll see a list of the host computer's USB devices that you can link through to the VM. At this point I'll plug in the Node MCU board and don't worry if you're using the ESP01 or a similar module because I'll show you later in the video how to apply these instructions differently. With the Node MCU now attached, clicking the USB button again should reveal an extra device in the list and while the name for you may differ, mine identifies as Chinheng Electronics USB 2.0 Serial. When I click on that it instructs VirtualBox to hand control of the USB device over to the virtual machine and we can see Linux now springs to life and identifies the device as USB 2.0 Serial and tells us that it's now attached on TTY USB 0. We can make this happen automatically in future by going to the USB button and clicking USB settings then on the right hand side clicking the add button and choosing the respective device. VirtualBox will now remember that we've associated this device with this particular virtual machine such that the next time it's plugged in it will automatically pass it through. We're done with the kernel log now so hit Control c on your keyboard to break out of watching it and run lsusb again and we can now see the device in the list. We can also have a look at the device file by doing ls-al slash dev slash ttyusb0. This is the system's interface to the device, implemented as a serial port thanks to Linux's inbuilt device drivers. We can see here that it's owned by the dialout group, which means that in order to get control of it, our user must be a member of that group. And to ensure that that's the case, run sudo add user, then our username of user, then the group name dialout. Hit enter, supply your password, and the change has now been made. But note that the change won't take effect until we start our next login session or shell. We're finished with the virtual console now, so type exit and then you can optionally hide it by going to the machine menu and selecting detach GUI. Though it's hidden, it's still running in the background. For what comes next, we'll use a terminal program with an SSH connection through to the virtual machine because it makes things easier. On Windows you can use PuTTY and on a Mac you can either use the built-in Mac terminal utility or my favourite, iTerm2. Launching iTerm we land first in the Mac shell, so we need to connect through to the virtual machine by running ssh user at localhost dash p 2222. This works according to the instructions in my previous video under the assumption that VirtualBox is configured to make the host computer listen on TCP port 2222 and forward it through to the guest VM's port 22 for ssh. You use the same parameters with PuTTY but enter differently through the GUI. Once we're logged in, run lsusb again to verify that the device is still there and in order to communicate with it now we'll need to install a serial terminal program called minicom. Run sudo apt-get install minicom, accept its dependencies by hitting enter and then when it's installed run minicom dash dash device slash dev slash tty usb 0. Inside minicom we can now hit control A and tap Z to bring up a help screen of various options and functions available inside minicom and we can see communications parameters can be accessed by tapping P. In here we can see that the default speed that minicom communicates with its serial ports is 115,200 bits per second, what's known as the board rate. And it's using 8 none one encoding, which I won't explain here but suffice to say it's most common. Hit enter to dismiss this screen and note that you can go back into it directly just by hitting control A and then tapping P without first going through that help screen. Now I'm going to press the reset button a couple of times on the Node MCU board and we can see that it's apparently sending some garbage through to Minicom. And it turns out from my prior testing that this particular board came preloaded with firmware that expects to communicate at a much slower 9600 bits per second. So hit control A and P again to go back into the communications parameters and while you could test various speeds, I'm going to just go straight for 9600. Now when I press the reset button on the Node MCU board, I get a more meaningful response. Don't worry if you can't replicate these results because there are many factors that may affect this and in the next steps we're going to install some specialised software that allows us to take direct control of the Node MCU and the ESP modules and reprogram them. We're done with Minicom now, so hit Control A and then just tap X to exit. Launch a web browser now and Google for ESP Open SDK, and it's the GitHub pfalcon page that you want. This is an open source effort to bundle together a number of firmware development tools with the official Espressif ESP SDK. Scroll down and you'll see some prerequisites for Ubuntu, which I actually have already installed, but I'll go through the motions here anyway so that you can follow along. 
First we'll copy this command here and then paste this into our Linux shell. To paste, you can just right click in PuTTY and it will paste immediately. And on a Mac you can use the command V keystroke or you can right click and select paste. There's nothing that it needs to do on my computer here so it completes relatively quickly. So I'll now go back and I'll copy and paste the other command into the shell as well. Now that we've got the prerequisites, um, we'll go and fetch the actual ESP Open SDK repository, but first we need a place to put it. So I'll make a directory called projects by doing mkdir projects, and then I'll change directory into that by doing cd projects. Back in the instructions now, as we scroll down, we can see the git clone command. So I'll copy that and then paste it into the shell. And this will start downloading the repository as well as a number of other linked repositories that it depends on. At the end, we'll go into the repository source code by doing cd esp open sdk. And then back in the instructions, we can see that there is the default make command used for building the, the actual software tools. So we'll go back to the shell and we'll run make. This kicks off uh, the longest process, which is in the order of 30 to 50 minutes, but I've sped it up about 100 times so that you don't have to wait. It's doing a lot of work in the background, building all the different components and downloading the actual Espressif ESP SDK. At the end, there is one extra step that we need to do that it tells us about here, and that is to extend the system path so that the system is able to actually find the commands that it's now built for us. Um, rather than run this every time, I'll just add this onto my login script. And to do that, do echo and then a single quote, and then copy and paste this line, and then a closing single quote, and a double right angle bracket, which means that we want to append onto a file. Uh, that file is in my home directory, which I can signify by doing tilde and slash. And then the name of the file is dot profile. Now that that's done, I can exit my shell, and I'm back in the Mac shell, then tap the up arrow to bring back the SSH command, log back in, and now when I do echo dollar path, my login script has run, and that new location is now prefixed on the system path so the system can find these utilities that have been built. The main utilities that I need begin with extensor. So if I type extensor, I can then use a feature of the shell called tab completion, where if I press the tab key once, the system will try and figure out what I mean. We can see here that it gives me an incomplete command. So if I hit the tab key two more times, it will give me a list of available options. And the one I'm looking for here is GCC. So if I append GCC now and do dash dash version and hit enter, that command runs successfully, so I now know I'm able to use the compiler. Now let's build an example firmware. Do cd project slash esp open sdk and run ls-al to have a look around. Go into the examples directory and you'll find Blinky. In there, we've got the C source code blinky.c for an example firmware that just blinks the LED on the ESP module. And it's accompanied by makefile, which is a build script used by the make utility. If we run make, we would expect it to just build the firmware, but instead you may encounter this error where it tells us that the memchr function is not defined. It turns out this is because this particular example was designed to be used with an older version of the Espressif ESP SDK, but we can get around that by just editing the make file. So run nano make file, nano is just a Linux text editor, and it's towards the end of this ldlibs line that we need to add something. You can see here a number of dash L parameters with various libraries specified, such as dash L phi towards the end. So after that one, add just dash L C I ROM. C I ROM is the standard C library, but implemented inside the internal ROM of the ESP8266 chip. Now that we've made that change, we can do control O on our keyboard to write out the file, followed by control X to exit. And when we run make now, it goes through and apparently it succeeds. So run ls-al and you'll see four new files in there. There's a couple of intermediate files, but the main ones we're interested in are these two bin files, which are two fragments of the firmware that would need to be uploaded to any given ESP module. We can upload firmware to the device using a program called ESP tool. So type ESP tool and hit tab and you'll see it's got .py on the end. And then do dash dash help and you'll see a list of subcommands. Now let's just start with a simple one, esptool.py chip underscore id. It gives us a result indicating that it's working properly. If this doesn't work for you though, I'll show you some troubleshooting shortly. Otherwise though, I'll carry on with some other examples. Let's try flash underscore id. This tells us information about the flash ROM that's on the board so that we can look that up to find out its size. I'll try another, read underscore flash. 
It tells us here that we need extra parameters. So I'll put in zero, indicating that we want to start reading from address zero, and that we want to read, say, 12,000 bytes, and put it in a file called test.bin. That works, and the LED blinks a little bit longer as it reads data off the device, and we can now have a look at that test.bin file um, to see what's in it. So we can run hex dump dash capital C test.bin, and then I'm just going to view, say, the first 10 lines of output. So I'll do a pipe delimiter and use head dash 10. And we see that data with the binary information on the left hand side and an attempt at an ASCII representation on the right hand side. Now I mentioned troubleshooting. If you're having some trouble communicating with the device, say a given process doesn't start or breaks halfway through, then you can actually slow down the rate of communication. You'll see that ESP tools support some parameters, uh, such as changing which specific serial port to use, or the board rate or data rate. So um, I can do an example here of ESP tool with dash dash port slash dev slash TTY USB zero. Let's say it doesn't find your serial port by default and you have to specify it. And dash dash board to specify what bit rate I want to use. So I'll use 9600 bits per second here. And then I'll repeat that read flash command. Now it runs a lot more slowly and you can see that the, um, the LED for serial communication stays on a lot longer, but it's going to be a lot more reliable. Um, now, you may not necessarily need to go down this slow. Uh, you might just need to drop it, say, um, from the default that ESP tool uses, which is 115,200 bits per second, down to maybe half that, 57,600 bits per second. Now this time I'm going to try another ESP tool command that may not behave the way you expect. Um, if we have a look at the ESP tool subcommands, we see that there's one called dump mem, which supposedly reads the um, internal storage of the ESP. 8266. So when I run that, it gives me again the parameters that I need to use. And I'm going to try reading from um, address zero. And in this case, I'll read four kilobytes, so 4096, and try and store it into a file. And um, it seems to just hang and then come up with an unusual error message. Um, so let's just verify the device is still working by going back and just running chip ID again. And clearly it is still working. So let's try and find out why that is. Well, if we go and Google for ESP8266 memory map, and we check out, say, this page here, then we can actually see that trying to read from address zero will cause a fault. And um, there are some other addresses that we are actually interested in. So if we scroll down, we can just say, pick this one here, um, and we need to put that in instead as a hex value. So I'll go back and I'll reissue the dump mem command um, with those different parameters. And now that we can, now we see that it works, but it does go a lot more slowly when it's trying to read from the internal memory of the ESP8266, because it actually has to go through a couple of different serial layers. We're nearly ready now to upload our example Blinky firmware to the Node MCU board and actually see it running, but there is one small change that I need to make yet. It turns out that the example is designed for a board that has its LED wired differently from mine, and you may find the same issue. So let's go and modify the firmware to deal with that. Uh, do cd tilde to go into our home directory, and then do cd projects slash esp open sdk slash examples slash blinky. And then uh, we'll use nano again to edit the blinky.c file. And it's at the end of this line here, where currently we're at first to pin one, I need to change that to pin two. So I'll make that change and then do control O to write out the file, control X to exit, uh, run make again, and then do ls-al and we can see those two firmware fragments there. Uh, and we'll now use ESP tool to upload it to the node MCU. So ESP tool and um, I'll be play it safe with the board rate here of 57,600. Uh, use the write flash command and then starting at address zero, we first wanna write this file then at this address, we want to write this file. Uh, so hit enter and that'll kick that process off of uploading it to the Node MCU. Um, it will do each part in turn. And then when it's finished, um, ESP tool should automatically reset the Node MCU board so that we'll then see the LED start blinking at a regular one hertz. Half a second off, half a second on. And we can see now that our firmware works. Woohoo! So how do you do this with the ESP01? Well, it's actually pretty much the same. You'll just need a programming duke. And while you could buy one, I'll show you the schematics because it's pretty easy to make one for yourself. On one side, you've got a USB to serial adapter which plugs into your computer. And ideally this would use the CH340G chip or the CP2102. 
On the serial side, it must operate at 3.3 volts. On the other side, you've got the ESP01. And both devices will probably use header pins and sockets to plug into the baseboard, which you will make. The pinout of the ESP01 is exactly as shown, but the pinout of your serial adapter may vary. It'll at least have a transmit line and a receive line, and these connect directly to the ESP01, and you'll also need to connect a common ground line between the two devices. The ESP01 also needs a 3.3 volt power supply, and it's likely there's a supply pin that you can use on the serial adapter, but if you find that it isn't strong enough to reliably power the ESP01, then you may like to have a jumper configuration for the option of using an external 3.3 volt power supply, which will then also share the common ground. The ESP01 also has a CHPD pin which must be pulled high, and the reset pin should be pulled high as well, but with a weak 10 kilo ohm pull-up resistor. This allows for it to be overridden by a push button which can drive the reset line to ground in order to reset the ESP8266 chip. The same arrangement will also be used on the GPIO0 pin in order to implement the flash programming mode button, which I'll explain shortly. The only other things that you may need are a 100 nanofarad decoupling capacitor wired as close as possible between the ground and VCC power pins of the ESP01 module in order to help stabilize its power supply. And you also have the available GPIO2 pin which you may want to break out for interfacing with other devices. If you were to press and release the reset button, the ESP8266 would go through a normal reset procedure and then run its firmware. If, however, coming out of reset it senses that GPIO is held low, it'll instead go into programming mode. So the correct procedure for putting the device into programming mode is to press and hold the reset button, which also disables any signal that it might be driving on GPIO0, then also press and hold the flash button, then release the reset button, and then release the flash button and the device should now be in programming mode. When in programming mode, ESP tool is able to communicate with the device, send it commands, and reflash it. Now, with the programming jig, you could build it using loose wiring and a solderless breadboard, but you'll get better signal integrity and hence better reliability if you make a more permanent arrangement, such as here where I've soldered it using protoboard. So now let's try using this jig. First I'll plug in the USB to serial adapter, then I'll plug in the ESP01 module, and then I'll attach it to my computer through USB. Going back into VirtualBox now, and assuming that the VM is still running, let's go into the Virtual Console now and click the USB button in the status bar, and you should see that your USB to serial adapter shows up there. The chip that's in my USB to serial adapter happens to be exactly the same as the one that was in the Node MCU previously, so VirtualBox has already picked it up and passed it through to the Linux VM automatically. So I will now go to my terminal program with I, where I have an SSH connection to the VM already running and I'll try running minicom dash dash device slash dev slash TTY USB 0. And at the default board rate of 115,200, I'll click the reset button on the programming jig and straight away I get some meaningful output because it turns out that the firmware that's on my particular ESP01 is already configured to run at 115,200 bits per second. But of course you can hit Control A and tap P if you want to experiment with different board rates for your device. Um, I'll exit Minicom now by doing Control A and tapping X and now I'll try using ESP tool. So I'll run ESP tool and try first the chip ID command. And then it hangs and it fails. Um, in this case, we have to manually put the board into programming mode first so that ESP tool is able to communicate with it. So I'll go through that four step special reset sequence. So press and hold the reset button, then also press and hold the flash button, then release the reset button and finally release the flash button. And now the device is in programming mode. So I can tap the up arrow on my keyboard to rerun that chip ID command and now it works. And the device normally stays in programming mode afterwards so I can run chip ID again and it's still working. Um, but I have noticed a quirk with this board for any of the flash commands. So for example, flash ID and read flash. Um, and I'll demonstrate that. If I run um, ESP tool flash ID, that works, but then it seems to throw the board out of programming mode afterwards, which means that if I then try and run, say, chip ID, it now doesn't work. So I've got to put it back into programming mode again, and then chip ID does work. So now that we've verified that, let's prepare our firmware. So I'll do cd tilde to go into my home directory, then cd projects slash esp open sdk slash examples slash blinky. 
and um, I'm going to use nano again to edit blinky.c. You'll recall that for the node MCU example we had to change this pin configuration from pin 1 to pin 2. Well it just so happens that with the ESP01 we've got to change it back to pin 1 again. So I'll make that change and then write out the file with control O and then exit with control X. I'll now run make clean to remove any of the old firmware compiled files and then I'll rebuild the firmware with the make command. Now that that's finished, inside there we have our two firmware binary files that are ready to be uploaded. So I'll run ESP tool and I'll run it at a board rate of 57,600 to be safe. Uh, I'll run the write flash command and start at address 0 with this file and then start at this address with this file. And it seems to have come out of programming mode again, uh, which tends to happen sometimes. So um, I'll put it back into programming mode again, tap the up arrow, rerun that command, and now it's successfully writing. Starting first with that smaller file and then moving on to the larger file. And then when it's finished, ESP tool will automatically send a command to the ESP8266 to make it then run that firmware and the LED starts blinking. You now have the environment, the software, the SDK and the hardware know-how to be able to develop, upload and run your own ESP8266 firmware. So what are you going to build? If you've got any questions um, or feedback on this video then feel free to leave a comment below. And if you like this video or think it will be useful for others then be sure to hit the like button. Also subscribe if you want to keep track of future videos that I release because I'll have some interesting topics coming up along these same lines. Otherwise, thanks for watching.